Welcome to the Sales Lead Dog Podcast, hosted by CRM technology and sales process expert, Christopher Smith, talking with sales leaders that have separated themselves from the rest of the pack. Listen to find out how the best of the best achieve success with their team and CRM technology. And remember, unless you are the lead dog, the view never changes. Welcome to Sales Lead Dog. Today we have joining us Robert Merritt. Robert, welcome to Sales Lead Dog. Hey, Chris. How are you? Thanks for uh, having me on the show. Very nice I am to, doing uh, well. I'm excited to have you here, Robert. Robert, tell us a bit about your current role and your company. Well, in my, uh, my current role, I'm the Chief Revenue Officer at, um, at E-Team and uh, also the Chief Revenue Officer at High Five. It's a little bit of a, of a complicated role, but I, I run global sales and marketing for uh, E-Team, which is a, a well-known um, and fairly large uh, staffing firm that's located in 14 countries globally. And I've uh, been in this role about nine months. I was brought on board uh, to help E-Team uh, take to market a variety of different investments that they had been making over the last four or five years and really turn those into a new digital entity that if done properly could bring disruption into the staffing industry. And so uh, over my first six months in the role, I spent a lot of time working on trying to figure out what this solution set was that would really differentiate in the market, uh, putting together a go-to-market plan, both on the sales, marketing and product side. And we launched the new brand, which is High Five. We launched that brand um, on January 6th of uh, 2021. And uh, it's been a really, really cool experience so far. You know, the, the solution that we've come up with is, um, it is innovative in the market. You know, we've gotten a lot of validation and, and uh, I would say verification from, from industry analysts recently that have talked about the fact that the High Five solution um, is solving a lot of the, the problems and filling a lot of the gaps in the space. High Five is a, um, a talent platform that brings together both recruiters as well as talent into one ecosystem. And that forms a, a digital talent supply chain, which gives us the ability to source talent anywhere in the world. And not only can we source talent anywhere in the world, we can do it pretty much for any skill. And we can also do it for any engagement type. So whether you want to hire full-time, part-time, contract to hire, contract, project SOW, it all can pretty much get done on high five. And that's, I think, kind of really the core of the value proposition that we're bringing to the market. That's incredible. Is that what attracted you to this role, this opportunity? Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I think that, to be very honest, um, you know, when I was going through my interview process, I, I uh, found that the solutions were somewhat opaque and confusing. I didn't really understand fully what all of these things were and how they would all work together. Um, but I did see one a CEO that had a very, very amb ambitious vision. And I saw some of the solutions, um, or maybe I, I saw in some of the solutions, some really, really interesting spins and twists on, on things that were currently available in the market. And so I kind of took a chance. I just, you know, I, I um, you know, kind of took, took a leap of faith into the role. And, you know, as I got into the you know, into the role, I realized that, you know, there were some investments that had been made that, you know, really weren't adding a ton of value, or at least wouldn't have a lot of viability in the market. But there were, there were some ones that were really interesting. And if we put them together in, in a way that was hopefully easy for the customer to understand, yep. you know, had a, um, had an experience, at least for the customer that was, was differentiated in comparison to what's in the market, you know, we, we could put something together that was really good. And um, I, I think it is good. You know, it's still early days. We just hired a sales team. Uh, so we have, have seven, uh, you know, passionate and courageous people that have, have come on to high five and, you know, are selling high five every day in the market. So it's been, um, it's been really good. That's awesome. That's awesome. What are the three things when you look back over your career that have really contributed to your success? Yeah, um, that's a good question. So, you know, I, I, I would say that, um, you know, first and foremost, you know, if you were to if you were to take a look at my SAT and my ACT scores, you know, we would all be pretty confirmed that, you know, I'm not the, you know, the sharpest guy in the room. Um, but something clicked when I got out of college and got into my my sales career. Um, you know, I, I realized for some reason, I realized at that point in my career that, 
you know, I really owned my own development. Uh, my mm -hmm. own self-development was my responsibility. It was not my employer's responsibility. And um, something happened to where I, I just got hooked on, on learning education, uh, trying to you know, understand my craft, trying to understand my customers, trying to create a knowledge base in business that would allow me to extend beyond the script or whatever that the company had told me to say. Yep. And, and you know, that allowed me to inject a lot of my, my personality into, into my sale. Right. And um, I've, I've carried that forward for, you know, 16, 17 years now. And, and I think, you know, uh, grabbing a hold of your own development, owning your own development is extremely important, especially, you know, for people that are early in their careers and, you know, trying to find that, you know, trying to, trying to get the bug of, of, you know, learning and development. Um, I, I would also say, you know, um, you know, another, you know, I guess maybe distinguishing thing in, in, in my career or, or, you know, something that has really helped my career is, is I've, I've always been willing to take a risk. Um, I, I think that, you know, in anything that you're doing in life, there is going to be the, uh, the chance or the percentage of failure. And I think that, you know, you, you have to realize that um, being successful in an opportunity, uh, a lot of it has to do about putting yourself in a position to be able to capitalize on the opportunity when it happens and being willing to take the risk when it happens and, and being able to look at uh, what is the reward that comes from this risk in comparison to, you know, the downside. And, and I've always been willing to take the risk. And, you know, I started my own business when I was 26. Um, I ran that business for seven years um, on my own, all the while, all the people that I was working with prior to, to uh, trekking off on my own, you know, they were becoming directors, they were becoming VPs, they were becoming presidents. And I felt like those people had passed me by. Right. Um, but what I found was, is, you know, that that risk taking that kind of entrepreneurial type of spirit, um, I caught up really fast, you know, once I kind of entered back into the, uh, you know, the traditional corporate workforce. And so I, I would say the, the willingness to take risks is, is, um, is important. And then I would say, you know, especially from like a leadership perspective, um, I, I don't, maybe it's something about my personality, but I, I do not have any problem with people pushing back on me. And um, I have always been successful at creating environments for people to work in to where they felt like they had a voice. They felt like they could be candid. They felt like they could disagree, um, especially with me. And, you know, we worked really hard to create an infrastructure around them and create mechanisms around them where they felt like their voice was heard. And, you know, especially when I got to Upwork, um, you know, we went from the Chicago location alone, we went from two people to 300 people in three years, right. almost four years. And, you know, within the first two years, we were, were voted... Um, uh, the best place to work in Chicago by built-in magazine or by, or by, by the built-in publication. And um, it was an amazing culture where, where people, I think, were excited to come to work every day. And I think that the team that I was on and the, the team that I led, we did a really, really good job of, of uh, trying to create an environment where people could, could feel like they could bring their whole self to work. And, you know, we created an environment where everyone that came to work knew that part of their job description was was really contributing to the progress of the whole. And so if you were going to be vocal, if you were going to be candid, if you were going to push back, if you were going to debate, like it all had to be solution oriented and it all needed to progress the business. Right. I love that. You're the first person who has added that component to their answer about their three things. Where did that come from in you? Was there a specific event or was that something that developed over time where you realized this is important? I want to have this as part of my uh, leadership uh, tool chest. Yeah, I, 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 uh, I can't necessarily say if I, I could pinpoint, you know, there, I, I read this or I experienced this or um, yeah, or, or, or any or any specific point of time in which you know I, I felt like that that was really galvanized. But what I can tell you is this: is you know um, being heard, um, having the uh, being empowered to communicate, um, and 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 also more more importantly, um, the value in being expected to communicate. Those are 
you know, the first two are, are basic like human needs. Yep. Uh, the, the second one is an unbelievable privilege, you know, to be in an organization that says like, not only do we want you to communicate, but if you're not communicating, you're actually not really fulfilling, you know, the role, like those things right. just made a lot of sense to me. Right. Um, and, you know, I, I think that I've, I've always tried to bring that into my teams. My, um, you know, my, my teams have always been, you know, very successful. Um, a lot of that also, I think, has to do with people selection, but that's a whole nother chapter in and of itself. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I think hiring good people and giving them the tools they need, giving them a voice and getting out of their way is what you got to do. Right. Think back to when you got your start in sales. Yeah. Is there one thing you wish you had been taught in that first job? Um, no, I, I actually, I'll think about that as I give you the answer, but, um, I was extremely, extremely fortunate when I got, um, out of college and got my first sales job. I went to work for an organization right out of school that was, um, from a market perspective, the market that they were in was uh, literally taking off right as I started. And um, it was a very sales driven organization, a sales culture. And not only that, but the executive leadership within the organization were, uh, were and still to this day, some of the savviest sales professionals I've ever seen and spent a tremendous amount of time and money um, investing in the development of the sales organization and providing them with the tools, you know, that they needed. Right. Um, and, you know, that is where I, you know, immediately got the bug for development. I mean, I think that that, that was the, um, the place where, um, you know, I, I realized there was no cap on anything that I could be. And so, um, of course, there have been just gobs of lessons that I've learned along the way. Right. Um, lots of mistakes that I wish I had had known that mistake was going to come up earlier. But I, I really do believe that I, I am one of the most fortunate people I can uh, think of because I, I just had such a rich experience in my first sales role right out of school. And those three years made just an unbelievable impact, not only on my you know, my career at that company, but my entire life. I, it's a funny story. This is somewhat frightening, um, but uh, I literally have a notebook that I carry around in my backpack. It's a, it's a manila folder and it's filled with every, uh, it's filled with notes from every single meeting I had with the CEO over a four year period of time, every training, every account review, you know, the, the knowledge that you received from, from those people was so good. I literally still carry it around in a folder about that big. Um, and, you know, I think that that's a testament just to how awesome that team was. What an amazing experience. I've yeah. incredible. You really were very fortunate because a lot of people I talked to, they're like, oh, I was thrown in the deep end. I had to learn how to swim. Um, yeah. And I think we all are, you know, one funny story, you know, when, um, when I, when I got hired at my first sales role, it was called a blueprinting specialist. So all I did all day long was call staffing firms. I had to do a hundred dials a day. And um, all I was doing was getting leads. It was like the first version of the SDR, like almost 20 years ago. Yep. And I would write all of the lead information down on blue cards and I'd go and literally hand them off to the salesperson. And um, I got promoted out of that role in, in three months and I got into my first account executive position. I was carrying a bag. Um, I needed to go close deals and it took me two weeks to set my first meeting. So I was doing hundred calls a day for two weeks right. and just, you know, no success at all. And I literally started to like tear up in my cubicle right. and this woman right. named uh, Stephanie that was in the cubicle next to me literally popped her head over the cubicle and was just like, dude, you need to relax. And so, you know, everybody, I think in sales to a certain extent is thrown into the fire, regardless how good the experience is. Right, um, right. So I think that those are all things that you just have to go through as a part of your, yeah. your, uh, your, your progress in sales. Right, right. Tell me about your transition into sales leadership. Was that an easy or difficult transition for you? It was, uh, it was an easy transition in the sense that I knew I wanted to get into leadership. 
it was an easy transition in the sense that I had a boss that said the um, when I got promoted, uh, they said, here's the good news. We want to promote you. Uh, the bad news is it's in Chicago. Uh, the other bad news is you need to make up your mind right now. So that made the decision really easy. Yeah. And uh, so I made up the, I made up my mind right then that I was going to get into sales leadership. And uh, 10 days later, I was in Chicago leading a team of, of 17 people. Um, so getting into sales uh, leadership was uh, was not hard. Um, the immediate lessons I think that you learn when you get into sales leadership, those are hard lessons. Yes. And um, being able to give people your really direct feedback, mm -hmm. uh, very crystal clear feedback in a way that is uh, still very human mm -hmm. and still very empathetic is a skill set that is learned over time. Very few people in my life have I ever known that are really, really, really good at that. Um, and, and that's one of the magic, you know, potions, I think, in good sales leadership is, is how do you stay approachable? How do you stay human, but also be very direct, very clear and set very clear expectations. And that, that was hard to learn, uh, you know, over those first, you know, year or so. Right. Think back to that time. Uh, was there something that you thought you knew when you walked through that door to be that, that first sales leadership role that looking back now, you just know was flat out wrong? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I think that um, there's probably a number of things. Uh, some of the things that I, I guess immediately come to mind are, you know, I, I think especially when you're early in sales, um, you want everyone, you want everyone to like you. Right. You know, you want to be liked by your team. Um, you want to be accepted by your team. You want everybody to buy into you and everything that you're saying. And uh, the reality is, is, is uh, that's, that's never going to happen. And, um, you know, you, you, you need to get really good at understanding what winning is as a sales leader and, and winning is not being liked. You know, Steve Jobs has an amazing quote that is like, if you want everyone to like you, you know, be the ice cream man. Um, and, you know, you're going to have to make decisions. You're going to have to tell people hard things. And, you know, I, I, I wish I had gone into sales leadership knowing for a fact that, hey, they're not all going to like you. Right. Now, and and no, nor is it your job to get them to all like you. Right. So I, I think that's, you know, one very, you know, very basic lesson. I think I wish I had known, you know, especially those, those first few months when I got into sales leadership. I think that, um, you know, another thing that I learned is that, that uh, there is, especially today, especially today, there is no prototypical model of what a salesperson should look like. Right. Um, not, not necessarily physically, but from personality traits, um, right. things of that nature, you know, the, the day of the salesperson that, um, you know, is, is telling football stories and fishing stories and, you know, really provides no value to the customer, but just has a great gift of gab and, you know, uh, amazing charm and personality. Like that is not a salesperson today. Right. And, you know, a salesperson, uh, today I think can be analytical data driven, um, you know, maybe even more of an introvert, you know, and maybe, um, you know, someone that, um, you know, doesn't fit that typical model, but provides incredible insight and incredible value to their customer. Like those are the deadly salesmen and women today. Um, you know, I, I think I wish I had been taught that early on that they're, they're not all success doesn't always look the same. Right, right. When you started building your team for high five, what was your strategy or approach to make sure you got the team you need? Well, um, again, I'm, I'm very lucky. Um, my, my strategy was, is, uh, I was, I was going to go hire people that had, uh, sold in and around the industry that we were in. So ideally they would have known something about the staffing world, uh, the talent landscape. Um, and, you know, even better, you know, they would have had some sort of experience in and around technology. Um, you know, we had obviously other components of the profile, you know, compensation ranges, amount of experience, uh, selling environments they'd been in, uh, you know, sales processes they might have been involved in. Um, but I got very lucky. Uh, literally, just as we um, were about to launch about six weeks before we launched, um, my, my former employer 
um, actually went through a process of, of laying some people off. Um, I was also very fortunate that they, they uh, didn't go through the traditional process of laying some people off. They actually got rid of a lot of really, really good people. And um, over the course of you know, the next uh, three or four weeks, um, well, first of all, when that happened, I, when I heard that happen, I immediately jumped on it. I was literally on the phone 20 minutes later calling people. Right. And you know, within, uh, within about three weeks, I had a team. That's amazing. Now I understand why you, you kind of laughed a little bit when I asked that question. <laughs> yeah, that's <laughs> that that's doesn't probably, happen. <laughs> that's probably not the normal, like that's probably oh. not going to make the final cut of this show. But <laughs> right, right, right. But tell me about what you were looking for in those people, because you you knew them, you had experience with them. Um, what was it about them that you said, I want that person for my team? Yeah, that's a great question. So I think like the first thing was, is um, when I knew launching High Five, um, a new brand, um, a new marketing strategy, a new demand generation strategy, everything is from scratch. So it's about, they're walking into literally the hardest sales job you could ever possibly imagine. Right. So I need really tough people. Yep. I need very resilient people. I need very tough people. So that was the first thing. Uh, the second thing that I want, um, you know, especially if I'm building a team is, you know, Everybody on that team has to have kind of a, uh, I guess, a growth mindset to quote, you know, Carol Dweck, you know, they've all got to be people that um, you know, are excited about the opportunity to learn and share from one another and get better and accelerate together. Yep. Um, and so, you know, people that, um, again, people that really devote themselves to trying to learn and, and understand their craft. Yep. Um, I think, you know, a little bit more of, of, a, of a tactical aspect of the hiring model or the, the candidate profile is, you know, I, I wanted people that had been able to manage the sales process from start to finish. So um, everything from uh, doing your own prospecting and lead sourcing, you know, cold calling, objection handling, setting and running your own meetings, you know, running all of the steps of the, of the, uh, the deal process, uh, closing, and then, you know, be able to drive adoption as well. So, you know, more of the account management and account growth side. So they needed to have a variety of, of skill sets in their, their toolkit. And then I, I think, um, you know, lastly, this kind of relates back to, um, you know, the, the, learning, the learning stuff. You know, one of the things, uh, and I actually did read this, and it did make an enormous impact in my, my leadership career. Um, there's, it's a very successful and famous book, um, Ray Dalio's Principles. Um, he talks about in that book, this concept of progressing the evolution of the whole. And it's this understanding that, um, you know, basically everybody in an organization has an opportunity to contribute back in a positive way to the development and progress of, you know, the organization. That takes a specific type of person, a very unselfish person and a very self-aware person that understands every meeting that they're in is an opportunity for them to either learn something or help somebody else on the team learn from what they're doing. There's an opportunity for them to share what it is that they're doing. And, and so those were some of the, you know, the personality traits that I still look for in salespeople today. I was just very fortunate in that situation when, you know, um, we were hiring, someone else was allowing others to move on to other opportunities. We were able to grab those others. Right. You mentioned before, you know, that you really want an environment of open communication. For that to happen, it takes trust. People have to feel secure enough that, hey, I can tell you bad news or something that I think you may not like to hear, but I have to trust that you're going to be receptive to hearing it. How do you create that level of trust? Yeah, I do, I do think it takes time, um, but, but I would say, you know, to you know, to give you and, and anyone listening, um, you know, some very, some very tangible things that you can do. You know, I would say the first thing is, is, you know, in that trust process, um, feedback should always start with asking for it. So someone always needs to be very proactive in asking for it, ideally the leader. And so, you know, it's, you know, trust is not built by um, right out of the get go, you know, spoon feeding and prescribing, here's what you can be doing better. You know, a lot of it is about, you know, asking for feedback on processes, asking for feedback on how we can improve, asking for feedback on how you as a leader can improve and, and starting to build up that um, understanding, you know, with your, you know, with your team members that 
I can be open with this person and it's not going to, you know, have some sort of ripple effect, you know, that's going to affect me negatively or, you know, I can give this person honesty. Um, I think after that stage, you move into step two, which is, you know, uh, you can start to give feedback. And, you know, hopefully if you've done it right, the other person is starting to ask for feedback as well. And it makes it a lot easier for you to give feedback. And so then you have this reciprocal exchange of information. And and then after a while, you reach kind of a a level of momentum or critical mass where feedback becomes very expected from within the group. And if you're not giving that feedback, there really is something wrong. And if people are not engaged in the discussion, there really is something wrong. And so it's almost like when, when you get to that stage, it's, it's really amazing because what you listen for is not what the volume and well, you don't listen for how loud is the noise in the room. You're looking for whether or not the room is quiet. Like if the room is quiet, it's like, okay, there's something wrong here. Oh yeah. It's like, yeah. if you have two-year-olds and uh, <laughs> the house yeah. gets quiet, yeah. like, okay, we've got trouble. <laughs> mm-hmm. That's exactly right. If you have two candidates, uh, when you're building a team, they're pretty much the same. What's the deciding factor for the candidate that you select? Oh man. So the candidates are basically the same. Uh, Similar resumes, similar experience. That is a really, really hard question. Um, I, I, I would say that, you know, all things being equal, I'm, I'm looking for what is the level of inquisitiveness in the candidate? Like what questions do they ask? Um, you know, what research have they done? Um, how prepared are they? Um, do they ask for feedback? Um, you know, how, how curious and inquisitive, you know, is this person? And, and then I think, you know, the last thing is, is going to be just, um, passion and enthusiasm. Um, you know, I, I, I think that whether you're an introvert or an extrovert, if, if, if you are a passionate individual, uh, you will find a way to get that message across. And, um, usually, you know, the good ones are again, regardless of whether they're, they're outgoing or not, you know, if they're a passionate individual, they will get you to believe what they believe. Right. Right. Or at least get you to believe in them. Yeah. I and I would, I would say one, one, one last thing, and I think this yeah. again relates to hiring is that, um, you know, this, this was always a, a part of any hiring process that I went through, especially if I was hiring direct reports. Right. And this again, is probably going to sound a little crazy, but hire people that you fall in love with, you know, you spend eight to 10 to 12 hours a day, you know, with these individuals, yeah. you really do have to you really do have to enjoy their collaboration, enjoy working with them. Um, do your best to hire people that you feel like you're going to end up falling in love with, because ultimately at the end of the day, like the job is going to get really hard. Uh, stress is going to be really high. Uh, you're not always going to agree. You're going to debate. You're going to fight. You're going to argue. It's like being with family. Mm-hmm. And, you know, you need to have people that you've got just like super, super tight, tight relationships with. I love that. One of my favorite topics, CRM, do you love it or do you hate it? Yeah. Um, do I love it or hate it? I, I would say like, you have to love the concept of CRM. Sounds great on paper, right? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know how anyone could argue that. So I, I guess I would be more on the, in the camp of, I love CRM. Um, I, I, I think that, you know, just like, you know, anyone that is listening to this show probably already knows it's as good as what you put into it. Mm -hmm. And I think that, you know, developing a lot of processes and a lot of expectations around the, the quality of, of your, your CRM usage is, is probably one of the most important things. Um, I think also making sure that you're doing a really good job of tying the why back to, you know, the CRM. Um, it's not for micromanagement pur- purposes, or at least not most of the time. Yep. Um, but but it is about acceleration and, and effectiveness in the job. And it is about visibility and understanding where the gaps in the sales process, um, where the gaps in now CRM is so unbelievably robust. You can, you can look at practically anything regardless of the industry. But yep. at least in my experience with CRM, there's, you know, 
it's it's going to give you a lot of what you need to understand about your business. Oh yeah, and the, the thing that I like to talk about too when it comes to you know the why when you're communicating a why to the sales team is helping them to understand that this isn't a tool just for the sales team. There are people downstream that are relying on good data so yeah. they can do their jobs and make good decisions for the business. Yeah. How do you, what's your approach for communicating that portion of the why to your team? Well, you know, I was talking about that whole, you know, kind of concept of, you know, progressing the evolution of the whole, like th that would be an extension of that. Um, you know, if, if like, you know, a sales organization does not do a good job of, of their, you know, their CRM hygiene does not do a good job of, of recording the data properly, keeping it updated. Um, you know, we are missing on an opportunity to improve in other areas of the business that really directly relates to, to them and is directly within their control. And so, you know, that's the first thing I would probably tell them is, is like, un understand that, you know, your world is not just like this, you know, this little bubble that you live in, like everything that you right. do, you know, uh, uh, has a ripple effect somewhere else. And That's so, right. especially as a salesperson, you know, um, and again, like we were talking about with CRM, CRMs now are so unbelievably integrated across the enterprise, they can affect everything from supply chains to, yeah. you know, God knows what. So um, yeah. I think helping people understand that, you know, um, revenue generation is really no different than a manufacturing line. You have to understand all of the things that need to occur from point A, you know, to point Z to be able to generate revenue. And you're just at one point of that process. And yep. if you're not doing your job, like it's not going to work. Right. Why do you think some sales leaders struggle with accountability when it comes to their sales team and CRM? I think that, um, You know, not not to give sales leaders a break here. Um, why do sales leaders struggle with accountability? Is is there are entire books written on that that subject? But um, I, I know at least from my personal experience, one of the difficulties in accountability as it relates to things like CRM is one um, having the data to begin with to know that you've got a data problem, and then two, um, you know, being able to to trust the information that you do have. And, and I think that um, especially in an environment where you're utilizing a CRM, you're not entirely sure if you can trust all of the information that you look at. You basically leave the door open for a tremendous amount of excuses. You leave the door open for a lack of accountability. And, um, you know, I, at least again, I'm just speaking from experience, you know, I remember at, at times in my, my current role and my previous role where, you know, the, the management of the CRM was extremely challenging because you didn't know what you were looking at. Just that simple. Oh, yeah. Yeah. From a data perspective. Yep. I, I talk about that all the time uh, when we talk CRM with clients and, and others that you, you, you got to start with data. If you can't trust the data in your platform, forget about everything else. Focus on yeah. that get that taken care of, then you can take care of the rest. You got a good foundation to build the rest of the stuff on. That's right. Robert, it has been great having you here on Sales Lead Dog. Um, it's really been enjoyable for me listening to you. If people want to reach out and connect with you, learn more about High Five or just connect with you personally, what's the best way to happen for that to happen? I, I respond to almost, you know, any, um, you know, any message request or any connection request or any message through LinkedIn. Um, it's on my phone. It's on my email. So uh, regardless of where I am, you're probably going to get me there. And uh, yeah, come come one, come all. That's awesome. Well, thank you again for coming on Sales Lead Dog. It has been a really great experience for yeah. me listening to you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for having me. It's been enjoyable. As we end this discussion on Sales Lead Dog, be sure to subscribe to catch all our episodes. On social media, follow us on LinkedIn, Facebook, and Instagram. Watch the videos on YouTube, and you can also find our episodes on our website at impellercrm.com forward slash Sales Lead Dog. Sales Lead Dog is supported by Impeller CRM, delivering objectively better CRM for business, guaranteed.